A warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today for this virtual academic program on national security strategy development and implementation in Africa. A special thanks and appreciation to those who attended round one and round two, and now with us in round three. Ramadan Kareem for our uh, Muslim participants. My name is Luka Byung Denkwal. I am the academic dean at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the faculty lead of this program on national security, strategic development and implementation in Africa. And I will be moderating this session. Before starting the conversation with the panelists of this, uh, this session, uh, let me share with you some key takeaway from session one on national security strategy, strategy development, implementation and sectoral strategy. Uh, uh, that session, let me share with you some of these key, key takeaway. The first is about the qu fundamental question, why public policies implementation often fails. Although there are many factors that can explain the failure of implementing public policies in Africa, the process of designing such public policy may be the common factor for explaining such a failure. In the case of public policies in security sector in Africa, the process of designing such policies are often top-down, elites or regime-centric and exclusionary uh, without involvement of citizens as a primary target of such policies. Site policies often result in the neglect of citizen security concern and setting impractical and irrelevant security goals, making site policies unable to get job done to meet the needs of citizens. The frequency of failure of site public policy is manifested, as mentioned by Matt Andrews, in the growing confidence deficiency of citizens in their governments because of their failure to deliver on policy promises. This confidence deficiency is exacerbated by the growing lack of confidence of public officials in themselves when they repeatedly fail to get things done, uh, resulted in what Matt Andrew called futility trap of public policy implementation. Then the question, how can we escape this futility trap? Escaping this futility trap in the insecurity sector in Africa rests with a new process for designing public security policies. Its site policies are designed in an inclusive, participatory, and people centric process. Government will be able to address progressively the security concerns of citizens. And that will make them regain confidence in the governments in delivering effectively security services. The process of national security strategy development, as we discussed in round two, is likely to address the security concern of citizens by articulating a shared national security vision and setting a realistic and relevant security goals, as well as providing practical implementation metrics and guidance for formulating and implementing sectoral security strategies as a mechanism for effective implementation of national security strategy. It will also provide a monitoring mechanism to ensure that national security strategy is adaptive to the changing security environment such as COVID-19 and to be implemented in iterative way. The last takeaway, why leadership matters in the implementation of national security strategy. As in the process of national security strategy development, the implementation of such a strategy requires not only requires not any other type of leadership, but a strategic and adaptive leadership with ability not only to anticipate future security threats, but also to proactively and iteratively counter security uncertainties such as pandemic based on continuous learning. Site leadership will ensure national ownership and provide as well the political will necessary for building a change mindset during the implementation of the national security strategy. 
These are three main takeaways from, from the last session. For these sessions on the national security strategy allocation of resources and leveraging partnership, we want to achieve three main objectives from this session. One is to discuss the link between national security strategies and allocation and realignment of resources among and between security and non-security institutions. Two, we will be examining how national security strategies can improve transparency and accountability in security resource management. And three, to discuss how a national security strategy can provide a framework to harness and leverage partnership in security assistance and cooperation. Now, let me introduce the panelists. I am pleased really to welcome three outstanding and seasoned experts and practitioners on budgeting, security assistance, and national security strategy development. And they will help us to start conversation about the practical process of implementing national security strategy. As you have their bios, I will highlight some, some relevant aspects of their expertise and qualification. Let me start first with Dr. Willin Johnson. Dr. Johnson is one of the key resource person for the Africa Center. And she helped us a lot in most of our program, including and particularly managing security resource in Africa. Dr. Johnson, she served as an independent consultant on issues related to strategic planning, budgeting, finance, development, and economic reconstruction. She served as the US Executive Director at the African Development Bank. And she was a member of the UN Committee for the Development Policy. She worked for about 20 years in the US Federal Reserve System. And she served as an adjunct faculty at the United States Institute of Peace and Columbia and Cornell Universities. She served as a member of the Board of Trustee of Tuskegee University. She's a graduate from Harvard University and St. John's University. She holds a PhD in development economic from Columbia University. We are indeed lucky today having Dr. Johnson with us to share with us her wealth of experience and expertise. You are most welcome, Dr. Johnson. The second uh, panelist is Ambassador Philip Carter. Philip, a great friend to the Africa Center. She has been instrumental in most of our program in the Africa Center, including managing security resources in Africa. Ambassador Carter is the president of the Meet Hill Group, an international executive advisory service. He served as a senior American diplomat in many countries, including Madagascar, Gabon, Bangladesh, and indeed also he served as the US ambassador to Ivory Coast and the Republic of Guinea. He was a deputy the commander for civil military management engagement, United Nations Africa Command in Germany. He served as the African Beirut acting assistant secretary at the US State Department. He also served as the director for West African Affairs and deputy director in the office for the East African Affairs at the US State Department. He was an international financial economist and a point person on the International Monetary Fund issues with Africa at the US State Department. Ambassador Carter, thank you very much for being with us today. And, and we, I, we believe we'll be sharing a lot of your experience with the participants. Uh, the, um, the last but not the least, as a discussion, Dr. Emil Udrago. He's a great friend to the Africa Center, as I mentioned previously. Uh, he's currently an adjunct professor of practice at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and has been engaging with the center since 2007. He compiled various case studies on the national security strategy development in Africa that provided a solid basis for the developing national security strategy development toolkit and he played a significant role in the drafting of this toolkit. Victor Emil, he is a member of the Africa 
African Security Sector Network. He is also the president of the Foundation for Citizen Security in Burkina Faso. He served as a member or the chair of the scientific committee that guided the national security strategy development in Burkina Faso. Also, Dr. Emil, he served as a minister of security of Burkina Faso, and he is a trained professional officer, and he retired as a colonel of the National Army of Burkina Faso. And he served as well as a member of the National Assembly of Burkina Faso, and also a member of the Economic Community of West Africa State Parliament, where he sat on the political affairs, peace, defense, and security committees. He earned his PhD from the Center for Dip Diplomatic and Strategic Studies in Paris, France. Emile, you are most uh, welcome. And let me start, let us start now with our conversation with uh, Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson, you know, budgeting and budget, budget in particular, is the practical tool to test the behavior and conduct of the government how the government is serious in implementing its policies. Based on your wealth of experience, uh, can you share with the participants in a simple way, the link between national security strategy and budgeting process and how having a well articulated national security strategy can help in prioritizing resource allocation and realignment of resources between security and non-security institutions, and even among the security institutions. You are welcome, Dr. Johnson, for six to seven minutes. And we hope you'll be simplifying some of the terms, technical terms of economics for the participants. You are most welcome, Dr. Johnson. Thank you very much. And thank you for the warm welcome from the Africa Center and for the opportunity to share this uh, virtual stage with uh, two outstanding thinkers in the area of uh, resource management and security. I would like to draw some on my experience, but I think it's also important to draw on the experience that the participants have had. Um, in particular, last week, uh, they thought about the process of developing a national security strategy and the way that having that process be inclusive helps to make the outcome more effective, but also helps to build confidence in the government and uh, the nation that is preparing that strategy. And so perhaps the most important message we have this morning is that process matters and inclusive participation is very important. In the budgets that I've been involved in at the Central Bank, at the African Development Bank, and also at the university, at Tuskegee University, um, we were participating in a form of shared governance. It was an inclusive approach that brought all of the stakeholders into the process of allocating the resources. But even more important, the budgeting was always done in reference to the strategic plan of the institution. And I realized that I was very fortunate. Somehow my budget um, management seemed to be less painful than some of my other colleagues. And I think it's because in each case, I was actively involved in the strategic plan. And so I saw the relationship of one to the other. For a nation, the national security strategy is that strategic plan for uh, peace and security in the country. The national security strategy establishes clear priorities. In the process of developing the strategy, the country develops its own definition of security. 
it identifies the threats to that security. And it also identifies those sectors or combinations of sectors that have the most effective policy instruments and programs to counter insecurity in the country. It is then the budget process that provides the nation with the resources that it needs to implement the national security strategy. So we're not concerned with the overall amount of the budget. And you often hear people refer to reports about the amounts that are being spent in a, in a specific country. Uh, we can't say that because a country is spending half of its budget on security that it will be successful. It is not the amount that is spent, but it is that amount relative to what the country needs. And it is the allocation of that amount to be sure, we want to be sure that the budget as it is developed in the process uh, allocates the resources to the different sectors conforming closely to the priorities that are outlined in the national uh, security sector strategy. The second question uh, is about the, uh, um, you explained very well the link between the national security strategy and the budget cycle and uh, the importance for the prioritizing allocation. Um, what are some of the key challenges in budget allocation and management, particularly in the security sector, and how can national security strategy help to overcome such challenges? There are challenges for the budget process overall. And one important thing to remember is that the security stra uh, strategy and the national security budget are integral parts of the government process. So all the, the government processes and the security sector budgeting must respect all the budget laws and the budget regulations. This process also must be guided by the principles of public financial management that guide every aspect of budgeting and procurement. But there are several principles that are particularly important when budgeting for the security sector. And I'm taking these principles from a World Bank document that was written more than 20 years ago, but has proven to serve important in guiding us even today. The principle that's very important for the security sector is that of contestability. That is all of the sectors must compete on an equal footing for funding during budget planning and formulation. And so when, when you identify a, one of the threats that the country is facing, you will consider all of the elements of the government and even some parts of society outside of the government that can be mobilized to counter that threat. The second very important principle is that of transparency. And by transparency, we mean that decision makers should have all of the relevant information before them and be aware of all relevant issues when they make decisions. And when I say all relevant issues, that also includes issues of pricing. How much does it cost? Does it conform with what you're capable of spending? These decisions and their basis should be communicated to the public. And in our discussion group, we 
have stressed that the national security strategy is a public document. And so is the budget that supports it. Finally, accountability is one of the guiding principles so that decision makers are held responsible for the exercise of the authority that they have. One difference though, well, I would say there are several major differences. The security sector does face unique challenges in both developing and implementing its strategy. Despite the fact that the national security strategy is a public document, there are parts of it that must remain confidential. And so the, the document though, it is best done, best informed by an inclusive open discussion, many people and certainly certain government officials have grown up in a world where the security strategy and the security budget are covered in a, a coat of secrecy. It's actually a culture of secrecy that some feel needs to surround anything that has to do with security. Well, there certainly are some factors uh, that relate to intelligence and operations that must be kept confidential. But this balance between security and transparency can be maintained by procedures and by clearly defined practices to control the flow of confidential information. Now, there's another factor that those of us who've worked in government are very well aware of. Um, from the outside, you may think of government as one entity, but those of us who've been inside government are very aware of which ministry we're working in. And there are times when we work to prepare to increase the status of our ministry. So interministerial competition is exists and it is often more intense in budgeting matters related to security. Although the principle of contestability indicates that we might need to expand mental health treatments in order to have better security in our communities, the police force often resists any reduction or transfer of its budget resources uh, to another ministry. While it is essential that the national security strategy provide evidence to support the allocation of resource, this challenge, this challenge of secrecy re uh, requires that the budget process, the combination of secrecy and interministerial competition requires that the budget process be managed by a well-defined organizing committee. It might be in the office of the president or the chief executive of the prime minister, but it might be within the parliament, but that committee must assure a timely flow and sharing of information and also needs to have the capacity to resolve disputes or delays that arise in the budgeting process. Now, if you put up the slide, please, we will be able to see how the security strategy fits within uh, the entire budget process. If you look at the outer rim of that slide, you will see that the golden circle there is, thank you very much. The golden circle 
is the overall budget. And so the security sector budget exists within both the framework and the confines of the overall budget. It is the overall budget process that defines your spending limits and allocates to the security uh, sector that which is available for it. And you, if you follow the numbers from the outside number one to the inside number one, you find that it is the security sector strategy that will define the allocation among different parts of the security strategy. And as you move to the second element, the outer circle of the budget preparation defines the resource allocation to the sector and the inner circle at that time is involved with budget preparation and resource allocation within the security sector. It's at that point where you are looking at preparing the sectoral budgets and defining the way that the money is to be spent. And as you move to the third step of budget allocation within the security sector, you have the funds going to the different ministries, you execute your procurement, but in each case, that procurement must conform with the very uh, well-defined priorities that were outlined in the national security st uh, strategy. At this point, you must be aware of issues of appropriateness. Are you purchasing? Are you training? Are you deploying personnel in a way that conforms with the national security strategy. And when you're looking at equipment, since you are now defining in your strategy requirements that ministries work together, you must be very sensitive to issues of interoperability. And so the overall framework of the national security strategy translates through the budget to the actual process of procurement, including the specification, uh, the uh, required maintenance, and of course, the most important uh, element of resources is the personnel and the training related to that. You then move on to what I consider a very important aspect, and that is the monitoring and uh, the monitoring and evaluation of those expenses. The last question I think you highlighted, and I like the issue of contestability. An idea of contestability is how you compete together with other sectors and what can make, make the security sector to be more contestable or be able to get a location of resources. It is the way to articulate their strategy and policies. Because as, as you mentioned, that the, the phase two, uh, phase one is about setting the policy. Phase two is really that allocation that is guided by policies and strategies. So contestability is linked to the, to the national security strategy. If it is well articulated, you'll be able to convince even the parliament and the executive, then you'll be able to get the share relevant and, in, and, and, and matching your, your strategy. Thank you very much. Maybe just briefly, and you have mentioned them, you have mentioned just only to, to, to share some of the key uh, guidelines and the best practice for security institution to improve that contestability, uh, transparency, accountability, and effective management of security resources. Just key, key, key best practice and guidelines. And you can briefly please, yeah. The, uh, I think all of the best practices start with human resource management. 
And that means that those who are responsible for planning the budget um, and also for executing the budget have the training that is required. They must also be properly vetted. Uh, we were talking about key challenges of the security sector. And perhaps the most important challenge is the fact that the weapon systems that are used in defense and some of the other expenditures and other sectors related to security, these systems uh, and can be very complex and they can have a long time frame to develop. Um, because of that, they are often also very expensive. And the security sector is considered throughout the world to be the sector that is most vulnerable to corruption. That is where the procurement process might be unfolding in a way that the security officer or the officer involved in making the decisions receive some benefit from the company that is actually selling the product. And so what we have seen is that there is a need to have very clear guidelines uh, in terms of how the procurement takes place. Whenever I did the procurement of um, any important equipment, I always had a lawyer with me from the very beginning who looked at the way I defined the equipment and to be sure that I wasn't giving advantage to one company or another company, that I defined the equipment according to the needs that were outlined in the national security strategy. What we've seen today uh, is that when countries have problems, they have moved away from that basic good sound practice of the procurement uh, that requires multiple competitors uh, where it is conducted uh, publicly when possible and where there is an assurance or guarantees for the quality of the output. Now, what we understand is that the problems that relate to corruption are not problems of government, they're a problem of government and the private companies. And so you've seen that some organizations such as Transparency International now yeah. rank the companies okay. in terms of their good practice. Okay. But the good practice includes an audit committee, it includes a general auditor who reports okay. to the Congress and the Congress having the ability to take okay. to court if there is a violation. So those, those are very basic and they apply to all the budgeting and resource management in a government. Oh, oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Johnson. I think that's a very, uh, yes, I want to, to share with the participants the diagram that, that uh, Dr. Johnson showed for you is actually uh, you know, you know, the reading attached is called the securing, uh, uh, securing development. It is one of the very highly recommended uh, reading, and it's from the World Bank. And let us now move to uh, to Ambassador Carter. Uh, Ambassador, definitely, the resource envelope for any country includes the assistance from 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 other countries, and especially the assistance is a, a very important component. It's, you cannot do without it. So it is part of this this envelope. But just, just you know, based on your experience, how effective from your own perspective has security system been in improving security governance in Africa and why? And if you can provide some example, we would appreciate that one. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ambassador. Dr. Dr. Luka, thank you very much. Um, and once again, I'd like to echo what uh, uh, Willine was saying about, uh, thank you for the invitation and the participation. Um, my co-panelists are, are folks that uh, know these issues inside and out, and uh, it, is, it is quite a, a humbling experience to be sharing a, a virtual dais with them. So um, I, I would have to say that when you look at the effectiveness of security assistance, um, 
as it is a means of improving security governance in Africa. I have to say that it, over history, historically, from my perspective, it's been a mixed bag. Um, you know, if you look over the past 30 years, security assistance contribution to the overall improvement of, um, or to the improvement of overall security governance in Africa has not been as effective as we would like to have hoped. Um, and uh, from my perspective, you know, there's been a, a significant amount of assistance that's been, you know, a waste, frankly, of materiel, of training and, and resources. And, you know, we have, you know, there's the stories are replete around the world and in Africa of, you know, rusting trucks and rusting boats and planes that don't fly, um, you know, uniforms that are rotting in warehouses. Uh, you know, these are not uncommon stories. Uh, fortunately, however, I have to say that, you know, uh, as, as African militaries, as regional organizations like ECOWAS and others, as the African Union developed further uh, and became more involved in um, the peacekeeping operations and requiring the support from the outside and within the continent, there was a shift. This also was parallel to some other shifts geopolitically, but I mean, there was a shift, but the issue of sustainability of training and material also remained problematic. And I think um, the shift in focus towards security governance, not just security system, but towards security governance uh, over the past few years has, in my opinion, been a major positive step um, in dealing with the issue of improving security and its sustainability. To me, the big issue for, for security assistance is the sustainability of it. And that ties into the issues that Dr. Johnson was talking about before with regard to how, how is this assistance being utilized? And you need a plan. You just need a plan. And um, I think, you know, from my perspective, this trend is directly related to the effort of African governments and their militaries to develop and implement these national security strategies. We've seen more, you know, I remember being involved in some of the very first development of these NS uh, national security strategies. And it was a, a unique thing. And I'm glad to see that this, this, this process is spreading throughout, uh, throughout Africa uh, in thanks in, in significant part to the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Um, you know, and I have to say why, you know, you have to look at this historically. I mean, before I found that security assistance was generated by good ideas made sincerely by people, you know, but those people were in Washington, they were in Paris, they were in London, Moscow. And uh, security assistance, particularly during the Cold War, was driven by the political and national security outlook of the donors and then retrofitted for use on the continent, right? Um, the objectives of security assistance were driven by the national security concerns and policies of governments outside of the continent for this geopolitical struggle that was going on during the Cold War. And those African governments that were adept at, uh, at reading the Cold War national security interests of donors, and you know, got more support, got more stuff. Um, how they use that stuff, how they sustain that stuff was, was not really addressed. And, but, you know, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the economic opening of Asia, particularly China, in a post-Vietnam uh, environment, that changed the security assistance game dramatically. It really did. And um, the importance of peacekeeping and the value of it to Africa be took center stage. You know, um, it wasn't this kind of Cold War bipolar struggle where, you know, the chess pieces were being moved around the world. It was something that was more of a communal effort to deal with security. 9-11, um, September 11th, 2001, uh, brought another change to the global security assistance environment. And the new competition between the West and China augurs further changes in this global assistance scene. And so, you know, but the need for effective peacekeeping will not go away. The threat of terrorism um, will persist and the return of this great power, power competition coupled with the transnational and global um, concerns such as climate change, trafficking, 
pandemics. We're in the middle of a global pandemic right now that has affected the entire planet. A new space race is developing. It's more, it's different from what we've seen before, but it's out there. You know, and accelerating technological change, things like artificial intelligence, um, genetic engineering, all of these kind of things that are hitting the, 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 all of us have made the space for security assistance even more challenging. So how does, how, do, how, does an, how does an African government, how does an African military compete against this? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we talked about the past, it wasn't that effective. Now we're looking to the future and we're saying that it, it's gonna become more complex. And I think, you know, in, against this increasingly complex environment, improving security governance is now more critical than ever before. You know, national and global trends, like I said, are becoming more complex and defining those national goals and objectives in the development, social and security arenas against this canvas, this landscape that is changing so much is essential for any government and its people, but it's even more essential if you're looking for a security assistance because there's a competition out there and the competition for donor resources and private capital to support security because now the private sector has a greater role today than it ever did before you know, is highly competitive. And that comp competitiveness is going to be increasing over time. It's not gonna get any easier. It's gonna get more, it's gonna get harder to get that security assistance dollar, yen, yuan, mm -hmm. euro. And, mm -hmm. and it, what I've seen is that those states with a plan will do better in getting the resources they need to advance their own national interests than those who are not planning for the future who are just responding to something that's happening now. And so, you know, that competition for the next security assistance, dollar, pound, franc, yen, yuan, will support those governments with a plan, a strategy that is well articulated and not just any plan, okay? You just can't say, oh, voila, here's our plan made in the president's office or the ministry of defense. No, 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 because you're gonna be competing. And the better the plan in terms of its articulation and its integration to a country's overall development strategy, the more attractive it is to donors, right? And these strategies and their implementation will be the ones that will receive the donor support in a sustainable way over time, okay? And one that is organic to deal with the constant changes that are happening around the world, like the impacts of climate change or demography. And more importantly, you know, those African governments that are able to articulate a well-formulated national security strategy that is integrated into a nation's overall development objectives will garner the interest, attention, and support of donors. That's, mm -hmm. to me, that's, you know, if, if you want security assistance, you have to have good security governance. And to have some good security governance, you need a plan, you need mm -hmm. a strategy. The character, quality, and structure of that plan will garner re support, not just nationally, which is even more important than donor support, nationally but internationally okay. i've seen that happen time and time again and it will also this is the important thing it will also help african governments to be better to direct the assistance they receive because you know in the past you know like i said security assistance was determined by sincere people working for their national interests in london washington paris moscow you know rome brussels what you want to see is security assistance should be determined by in African capitals rather than in those donor capitals, right? There has to be a balance there. And so this can only happen with a plan, with a strategy that is crafted holistically with national stakeholders. And given the global competition for resources, those with a well-crafted inclusive strategy and plan will do better than those without. Okay. That's, to me, that's, that's fundamental. And so I think it's absolutely critically important, especially when you take into account what Dr. Johnson was saying before, because listen, you know, she's the pro, right? She, she knows more about this stuff than I can ever learn, right? She's forgotten more than I can learn. And the fact, fact is, is that those issues of contestability, transparency, accountability, you know, donors are looking at that. Donors are doing the same thing to justify their budgets to their conferences. And if they're saying, Congress is saying, well, okay, you're giving these resources to this country, why? 
you know, well, we can articulate our national security interests, but those interests are going to be even strengthened when we're dealing with an African partner who has clearly articulated and put in place a strategy that can explain why they're using these resources. And so there's a marrying of policy as well as a marrying of, of objectives. You know, this is a critically important thing for donors to justify their expenses to their uh, parliaments and congresses. Excellent. Uh, yeah, um, Ambassador, thank you very much. And I think people will be asking more questions from you. I always remember you when you talk about the, uh, this assistant has a national, other national interest. So oh, yeah. it's, not, it's not a freelance. It's, 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 it's an inbuilt interest, national interest of those countries. It is the way you design and make sure to align this, um, this assistant to, to meet your needs. It can only happen unless you have your own a vision and a strategy to guide this external system. So really, really thank you very much. And I would like just to bring to the attention of the participant in case you want to ask question, please use the, fun the, the chat function. You can start writing in your question and then we'll handle them as we move for the, uh, the preliminary, I mean, the, uh, answer, the question and answer session. Uh, the last panelist now, um, uh, Dr. Emil. Emil, just only briefly, because I think we an excellent contribution from uh, Victor Johnson and, and Ambassador Carter on just two, two aspects, your own experience. To what level do you think the, uh, the, uh, the national security strategy will be able to help in the allocation of resources? That's one. And then to what level national security strategy will help in leveraging partnership and, and assistance? And give your example. It would be good in within 10 minutes. We would appreciate that one, uh, Emil. I know it's, it's, a, it's a heavy loaded question and uh, I would appreciate you all. Yeah, please, please welcome uh, Victor Emil. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Luke. Uh, it's it's a very difficult to add something to what uh, uh, Ambassador Philip uh, Carter and Dr. Willard Johnson just said, but I will just uh, try to give an, an African perspective to what uh, you just said. Uh, for, uh, regarding what uh, Dr. Willen said, she has really paved the way for my uh, re re remarks I wanted to, to, to make. But I will start with the last sentence she said. She said that uh, uh, the, it's not a matter of uh, uh, giving a huge amount to, uh, to, 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 the, to, the, to the defense sector, but it's, it's a matter of giving the right allocation to the, to the institutions. It's very important. And in, in terms of allocation of resources, uh, let me say that in Africa, the defense uh, and the security sector has the, the, the lion share. Uh, we had a study done by CIPRI in 2017 uh, showing that uh, security and defense sector still uh, remain constantly increasing in, uh, since five decades. Since 1966, since independence days up to now, uh, this sector is still constantly increasing. And according to the same uh, study, CIPRI study, uh, sub, sub, uh, sub, 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 Saharan Africa ranked third among the regions with the highest military expenditures in relation to, to GDP, showing that if what now we, we are witnessing with, the, uh, with the terrorism is going to be uh, more and more uh, increasing. When I attended the last uh, international forum on Eastern security in Dakar, the minister of Niger was stating that 19% of the national budget was allocated to the security sector. And the, name, uh, the, the, the minister of foreign affairs of Mali was saying that 22% uh, of the national budget of, uh, is allocated to defense and security sector. And it's almost the same thing for Burkina Faso. Only Senegal, only Senegal, conversely, According to uh, the president, uh, Professor, uh, President Makisal, continues to allocate a more of its budget for health and uh, education. So it's very important to, to note that. What is also important in what uh, Dr. William said is now African countries have they have embarked they have embarked on financial planning laws for the security and defense forces. I think it's good. It's very, it's, it's very commendable. We should even encourage that. 
This is part of a multi-annual public finance management. And this approach is allowed for a better uh, resource uh, planning, especially in the field of defense, where we have a very heavy uh, military expenditure. But I say but because if this initiative is not derived from a holistic and national security strategy vision with an effective monitoring and holistic uh, monitoring of oversight mechanism, respectful to the guiding principles uh, dictated by uh, the, what uh, Wellen uh, Johnson just said, contestability, accountability, uh, and transparency, it's, it's going to be a trap, a trap where un, no scrupulous uh, leaders would just uh, miss, uh, uh, I mean, uh, take, take the money and vanish. And we have a lot of cases recently in Mali. And we have also a case in Burkina Faso uh, where uh, within six months in office, the minister was able to build a mansion. And uh, for, unfortunately for him, he was caught and went to, uh, to prison. So I, I would like to, 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 to keep uh, in the time uh, given by Dr. Luca and make the link with uh, what uh, uh, Ambassador Phil uh, Cut, uh, Philip uh, Carter uh, just said. I will try as much as possible to share African uh, experiences, including uh, maybe the one of Madagascar. And what is important, uh, Ambassador said, we have a plethora of external partners. Regarding security assistance in Africa, we have a lot of assistance. It's not the what, what is missing. But I would like just to highlight the major security external partners in Africa. I will not go deep inside, but I will start by US security assistance in Africa. The US is providing capacity building for African peace support operations and professionalization of the armed forces in Africa. It's also providing capacity building in countering terrorism and also conflict prevention, mitigation, and resolution. From EU, Africa is benefiting from peace mission, a peacekeeping missions, capacity building for security and defense forces and judiciary, training and operational assistance, and uh, specifically security sector reform. Uh, we can see that other countries like Russia has come in, uh, China, India, Turkey, Brazil, and also the Gulf states. So how do we manage? How do we harness this plethora of external partners? That is the, 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 the question. And this is not done without uh, ch challenges. I will just highlight uh, the major ones. I think uh, Ambassador Phil or Philip, uh, I used to call him Phil because of he's a good friend. So Ambassador Philip mentioned some of them in his remarks, but let me just hammer on three of them. The first is a national ownership. We have a lot of external assistance, external partnership, but the national ownership is lacking. Uh, meanwhile, we know that national ownership is key, is key for the development and implementation of any uh, public policy. And uh, when it comes especially for national security strategy, and we, uh, we, we listened to Dr. Matthew uh, last week during session one, how he stressed on the importance of a national ownership. And this is lacking. This national ownership is lacking. And the vast majority of uh, this external uh, assistance are uh, uh, externally driven. And what is, important to not notice is that this assistance, some of them are not fitting into a locally generated, negotiated, inspired ideas based on a clear vision of security and national security objectives. That's the main issue. This is a big challenge. How to match it, it's a, it's a serious uh, uh, challenge. The second challenge for me is the alignment of security needs with the assistance of external partners. We are still struggling in Africa to match the assistance uh, we, we, the recipient countries are receiving. And when you take the case of, of Mali, Mali had a myriad of, 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 of external assistance, a myriad of external assistance. But up till now, I think it's, it's still struggling to, to find a, a, a way for security. And the last challenge I would like to, uh, to, to highlight is the lack of coordination 
between the recipient countries. Uh, it's it's very important. When you don't have coordination between the recipient countries, it's 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 ends up it it could end up with a duplication, a redundancy in some activities, and this uh, will reveal finally counterproductive in terms of, of security. And exactly the case of Mali is the a very is it's it's a good illustration. As I said, more than twelve partners in security assistance, but still. The results are not satisfactory and even sometimes disappointing to some uh, extent. Only a coherent and a comprehensive national security strategy could leverage external assistance and partnership with Africa. So uh, it takes me to the end of, uh, of, 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 of Lucas' question. What do we do? National security strategy for me will allow a better use of the resources. It will provide a clear benchmark which will strengthen the security sector governments, governance. And what Ambassador Philip just said, it's very important. The new trend now is how to strengthen the security and governance. And uh, finally, the national security strategy will contribute significantly to ensure national ownership and leverage uh, security partnership and external assistance. So Dr. Luca, uh, you asked me to do it in 10 minutes. I did it in nine minutes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, precisely. Oh, oh, thank you very much, uh, Emil. And uh, I think you really concluded in a very good way. And I could see the complementarity between all of you. Having um, um, Victor Johnson uh, focusing on the whole of the, the role of national security strategy in relation to budgeting process. And uh, an Ambassador Carter coming very clearly how you can compete to these external resources is through your national security strategy that is clear with these ingredients, the principle that uh, Victor Johnson uh, provided. And I think you provide a good example of the African context, the importance of national ownership. And I think I like the way you, you also concluded with the issue of uh, coordination. Uh, some of us being in government, it is a big thing. The coordination, even not only between the government, within the government itself, but between the government and the external actors that even the donors themselves among themselves, it is a big thing. And in most cases, it's one of the things actually letting not only a system not to deliver, but also the, the government not also to have the leverage in how you can. So it is a good point that you raise the issue of coordination. So really, I, I just would like really to thank on your behalf, the great job done by the three panelists. And I think you have, you have really paved the way for a good discussion for the uh, for the uh, for this session, and I think this is a practical way of how to implement national security strategy, resources, partnership, and national ownership. So really, thank you very much, um, yeah, Dr. Johnson. Thank you very much, Ambassador Carter, and and Dr. Emil. You have done a great job, and we are so grateful uh, for for such a contribution.